Have you ever received startling news? Life's surprising turn? Something unexpected? Of course you have. It's called living. But I bet you have never received news like Jesus' mother did the first time she found out that she was to be pregnant with the Son of God. All because she was found to be in favor by the Lord and is blessed among all women. Now there's much attention on her reaction to Gabriel's news. How will this be, she inquires, since I'm a virgin. Now I've seen in some places that this expresses Mary's doubt, but I'm not convinced that that's an accurate portrayal. She is asking a legitimate question. And this question makes me wonder how many of us find listening to the Lord or obeying his news a confounding experience. You want me to do what, Lord? Now, many businesses and education context, the art of best practice is employed. Best practices are commercial or professional procedures that are widely accepted or prescribed as being correct or most effective. When we're desiring to obey the Lord, but are so confused as to how, maybe employing the best practices can be our solution. So what are the best practices for obeying God? Well, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Look no further than Mary herself. There's a pastor by the name of Scott Gibson who paints a profound picture of Mary who is present at a few significant events in the New Testament. First, at Gabriel's announcement, Gibson says this, Mary's obedience in light of this miraculous experience underscores for us this truth. We serve the Son of the Most High God who came to save us from our sins. Next, Mary is pushed out to a barn since there was no room in the inn. There, she proceeded to bore Jesus. Of this, Gibson states, Mary's experience at Jesus' birth underscores that God chooses the lowly to show in his holiness that Jesus Christ is Savior to all kinds of people. Then, Mary is present at Calvary, where she witnesses the cruel cross of crucifixion. There, Mary was gripped with grief and sadness as she watched her son die. Yet, bearing witness to the crucifixion also means she was there for the resurrection. This encapsulates the full gospel. The celebration of the incarnation is the perfect time for followers of Jesus to tell others what we know of the Lord is this. His name is Jesus, our risen redeemer. Perhaps though, it's Mary at the nativity that we are most familiar with. This makes sense. However, after a while, her response still gets me. She sang a song. Now I won't sing it for you, but the words go like this. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate for his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She's a psalmist. Affectionately, this song is called the Magnificat, a song that burst from the heart that overfilled with praise. It is a lifting of the Lord from an inward spring of hope and to be moved like that. Now in considering Mary, it occurred to me that she's the very first Christian theologian. She's the first human being to consider the implication of Jesus's birth. And she's the first to try to use words to describe the incarnation of Emmanuel. Pastor Daryl Johnson sees three implications of this. First, he says, Jesus' arrival demonstrates God's mercy on those who fear him and scatters those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. Another way of looking at it, he exalts the humble, brings down the mighty from their thrones to their knees. Secondly, 
Jonathan says, Mary speaks in the past tense, has scattered, has exalted, has brought down, has filled, has sent away. Jesus isn't even born yet, hasn't even left the womb. She truly is a deep theologian. But why does she speak this way? I like how Michael Wilcock describes it. With sudden insight, she realizes what the end of it all will be and rejoices that since God has set his saving work in motion, it is already as good as done. Thirdly, Johnson points out that Mary's song is not a call to revolution because Mary is not celebrating human achievement. The key word is a simple pronoun, he. He has shown mercy, he has brought down, he has lifted up, he has done great things, he has turned the world upside down, and when he does, don't you wanna be found on his side? Did she have questions? Sure, who wouldn't? But don't mistake those questions for crippling doubt. Mary's example of obedience in uncertainty is unparalleled in all of human history. She was a living monument of the hope of the Advent. Now today, in this season, devote yourself to hope. Find the same hope that Mary sings about. Allow yourself to burst with praise, knowing the startling news is a great expectation that is met in the person of Jesus Christ. Light this candle of hope because the old order of human achievement is gone and the new order of Jesus' finished work has arrived.